Lord, you have given us a spirit of power, of love, and of sound judgment. And I pray that you help us with everything that is going on in the world right now to, to use your power within us, your love, and the sound judgment that we can find in your word for how to live and how to act and how to treat others um, and how we respond to what's going on. Lord, we lift this song up to you and I thank you for the gift of music uh, as a way to express ourselves. So I know this isn't the best way to start a new song because I can't gauge your reaction and um, see if if you're getting it or if we should go over that part again. Um, but we do have the words, thanks to Jeff. And uh, he's done an excellent job of, of getting them up there every week. Um, so follow along with the words. And I hope that this new song touches your heart the way that it's touched mine and that it gives you a reminder of the certainty that we have in, in Christ and how he can take anything, any, any shame or hurt or brokenness and make it good. And that includes here within us, in those we love and in, in the world around us. And we can look forward to when he does come and, and make it all right again. But this song just brings so many Bible stories to mind where God has, has done miraculously good things. Um, and it's a reminder to look at ourselves and the miraculously good things that he's done in us.
Lord, we thank you that you can make good out of anything. We thank you that you can restore us from, from sinfulness into righteousness, God. Help us to live in that righteousness. Help us to put the old, the old self to death every day to continue to examine ourselves and help us to rest in you and let you do the work in us. Well, in the church Zoom meeting on, on Monday, uh, that'll be tomorrow for you when you're watching this. Um, it's been really fun and it's been a good time to just enjoy each other, check in and, and laugh a lot. Um, I hope that we can all meet again soon in person because it's just not the same seeing your face on a computer screen. Um, for now, we can rejoice in the technology that we have available to us and ultimately um, in our hope in Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior.
Well, good morning. It is good to gather together by the Spirit of our Lord and His presence with each one of us. Today's message is an important message, and so I would ask you to make sure to get your notes uh, right now so that you can be ready and not only follow along, but I'm hoping that you will uh, use them for reflection afterwards. I think that's going to be uh, very important. So again, would ask you to do that. And uh, so grateful that we can be gathered to worship today, even in this way. Let's look to our Lord in prayer. Our Lord, as we ponder the events in our world, we see that there is clearly something that's wrong. Not just with COVID-19, but even way beyond that. And there's so much chaos and confusion and misinformation and division and fighting and, and domination. And even when there is good, there is opposition that's against it. So Lord, we thank you for giving us essential insight into the story that we're living in and that there are things and, uh, that are against us and, and insight into what we are up against. And so this morning, we ask that you would please open our eyes, open our hearts to see and to respond in truth, to take appropriate action, and wisdom and clarity and courage. And our Lord, we pray all these things in you, in your name, in your presence with us. Amen. We're, we are in this series, The Art of Parenting, and we have said that it's important to know our purpose. But it's also important to know what is up against us or what we are up against because there is opposition to our purpose. Now, what football team uh, would play another team without knowing uh, who they are or what they're up against or having some kind of a game plan or strategy for that? I mean, it would be like uh, you, you ask, uh, uh, who are you playing? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Well, uh, what kind of offense do they run? Mm, I don't know. Well, what's their, what's their blocking scheme? How does that work? Uh, I don't know. Well, well, what's their defensive scheme? Uh, I don't know. Well, what, what players should, be, should you be aware of and thinking about and carefully prepared for? Uh, I don't know. Well, what plays have you designed? Have you designed some plays? Oh, no, we, we don't have any. We just kind of go out there and just whatever happens, that just happens. Well, I, I think I can speak prophetically that uh, your team is going to lose. And what army would go into battle without knowing uh, where and who they're going to be fighting and who, what they're going to be up against? You just wouldn't do that. You wouldn't go into battle without having a plan. Well, this morning, we want to talk about what we are up against as parents and mentors and teachers and uh, community members and citizens and matriarchs and patriarchs and just our different roles and where we live. And I would ask you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis 3. Genesis 3 gives us insight um, essential insight into the story that we're living in and what we are up against. And we're going to make several observations. Let's begin in verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning, or excuse me, was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? We want to make several observations just from this first verse. So, first of all, the serpent speaks, and there's a lot that we could do in unpacking the serpent. We're going to do that another time. But in the larger story, we know that this is a spiritual being, the personification of evil that is connected with this beast or a wild animal that has been created. And we need to remember that this is a story. And it says that the serpent was the most cunning of the wild animals that were created. Now this word uh, can be translated, uh, and it is, if we look in some of the different uh, Bibles, translations, uh, most crafty, most clever, uh, more shrewd. And this word appears 11 times in the Old Testament. 
And in most of its uses, really all but two, it has a positive connotation. It carries ideas of thoughtfulness, of careful consideration, of prudence, of uh, of, of carefully observing and analyzing and thinking about and thinking over and thinking through. Thinking through something and making a skillful choice uh, and taking wise and prudent action because you have been thoughtful in considering, you have been calculated in considering to arrive at a wise choice or at a wise way of life. And that's how this is used uh, most of the time in the scriptures. Obviously here it's a negative sense. And the point is that there is careful scheming, thoughtful, shrewd calculation that goes into coming to this place of great destruction, this certain destructive result that takes place. And so this is our first insight into what humanity is up against, and you can write this in your notes. There is a shrewd and calculation personification of evil in this world. Now, this is no small thing as we think about our responsibility as parents. There is a shrewd and calculating being that embodies evil in this world. And what happened in the garden in the very beginning was a carefully calculated and studied act of aggression that took place. And as a parent, and a grandparent, and a member of society, you better think long and hard about that. This is what's taken place uh, ever since Genesis 3. This is what's taking place right now with COVID-19. And whatever comes next in the next couple of weeks, or a couple of months, or two years, or 10 years down the road, there's a need to be, we might say, alarmed and aware. There is a shrewd and a calculating spiritual being who embodies evil in this world, who is acting against humanity in creation in aggression. And that is who and what we are up against. Well, a second observation. And that is that the Lord gave space, gave space for the man and the woman to fulfill their cultural and historical mandate. Now, the Lord has been present and all involved in creation. He, he created everything. And he's there at the beginning as, as, as culture and history, uh, the culture and history of civilization is beginning. But it's important to see that the Lord also, in a sense, steps back and gives space for the first humans to act and to stand on their own in the vocation that they are given as uh, living, uh, breathing idols, living, breathing imagers of God that they're created to be. And this is not that God is apart from them in his life. He's there in his life, but he gives them room to act in their role of authority and responsibility that they are given to fulfill their work, to fulfill their calling in the vocation that they are given in being part of his family and being his living idols. And this is, takes us back to the human historical and cultural responsibility that we've looked at. God gave them space to take responsibility. God gave them space to act. And this is the way that God has designed our world. And there is still human, cultural, and historical responsibility that God respects today in how our world functions. See, where we choose what we're going to do, and that affects culture, and that affects history. That affects what happens in the world. And that happens on micro levels, we could say, in individuals and homes and families, and it happens on macro levels in kingdoms and governments and world leaders. Now, a third observation is that the serpent shamed Eve directly and shamed the Lord indirectly to Eve. The serpent distorts and casts doubts and throws a negative light on Eve and also on the Lord. The exchange between the serpent and Eve starts with this distorted question designed to cast doubt on Eve herself. Did, did she hear the Lord right? 
Was she wrong? Could she be being mistaken? So let's read again, pick up at, uh, in verse 1, uh, middle verse 1. One day the snake said to the woman, Did God really say that you must not eat fruit from any tree in the garden? Now that is nothing at all like the Lord had said. And that question is designed to directly shame Eve and to indirectly shame the Lord to Eve. And the serpent totally twists the nature of reality. He twists all the blessing and the goodness that the Lord is giving, and he twists it into this ne uh, a negative and shaming mindset that cast out. Not only that Eve somehow got things wrong, but it also casts doubt. It's casting an eye towards the Lord that somehow he is not being good, that somehow he is holding back. He's holding out on them. And we see that shame is the weapon. I'm going to say that again. Shame is the weapon this evil being uses to lead the queen, that's what Eve was created to be, into self-doubt and towards an internal crisis and into insecurity. And after his twisted question that, and the doubt that that cast, he closes the deal with just an outright blatant lie. And the serpent outright lied about God. He lied about reality. He lied about truth. Verse 2, the woman answered the snake, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God told us you must not eat from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not even touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, <laughs> oh, surely you will not die. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like divine beings who know good and evil. The serpent outright lies. The serpent once again, even more strongly, even more accusingly, shames the Lord to Eve. He does that with this lie. Like, hey, the Lord is holding out on you. He's holding back good. He's holding out blessing. And the woman is convinced and she takes some elements of, of truth and then this distorted thinking and the crisis that she is in and she acts to put an end to her shame. She acts to define things on her own and in light of the lies that the enemy has fed her. And she in fact accepts and agrees with the serpent's lies. And she sees that the fruit is good to eat, that it's beautiful to look at, and she believes that it is able to make her wise like the spiritual beings that are around her in the garden. But instead of wisdom, death happens. Now, when Eve is later explaining things to the Lord, she says, the serpent deceived me. And that is so true. See, the serpent's intent was to destroy, to sabotage, to carry out a coup, to kill the first humans, and to usurp, to take their kingdom, to take their rule away from them. And so he did. Now, this connects with what Jesus said in John 10.10. 10. In fact, I have it in your notes under, under number three. It says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give life, life in all its fullness. Now, it would be a great idea for each one of us, our children, our, our, our grandchildren, to memorize this verse. Because this is the story that we are living in, and it's, like, it's in a nutshell. It's, it's right there. We can see it, we can grasp it, we can understand it. And we need to be aware of what we are up against, and we need to have a game plan. And then a fourth observation is that this whole interaction that is taking place, it's taking place with a beast, a beast of the ground. A place to write that in your notes. This is a wild animal of the field. Now this could be, should be a clue that there is something very upside down coming. The king and the queen are made, they're mandated, they are to rule the animals, but instead the king and queen are allowing the beast 
to exercise influence over them. Things are turning upside down. This is the upside down. The beast is asserting authority in a deceitful way. And this is an indication that our world is being turned upside down. And this is part of the clever and the cunning and the calculating scheme of the serpent. Now, if we drop down the text, we see this upside down being filled out, what, what it is. And uh, we're going to do, in fact, if you turn your page in the notes to the, to the next page, you can follow along with that. And uh, we're going to look at the other results that take place in addition to the immediate results of their disconnection and, and the shame that took them over, and really took them over is a good way to say that. We're just going to make some quick, uh, broad brush foot strokes and bullet points here, but they're important. And so we can begin with the first is that Eve speaks the truth in saying that she has been deceived, and there's a place to write that in your notes. Now, if we were to look up deceive, it would say something like this, and again, I have this in your notes, to give a mistaken impression and to cause someone to believe something that is not true, typically in order to gain some personal advantage. And so uh, there's lots of ways you can talk about this. To swindle, defraud, cheat, trick, hoax, dupe, outwit, lead on, seduce, ensnare, entrap, beguile, con, to take us for a ride, to put one over on us, to snooker, and to stiff us. It's amazing how many there, words there are to talk about this, and this is only just some of them. I just picked a few. Now, have you ever been snookered? <laughs> I have. And it is infuriating and embarrassing and maddening and shameful when you realize what's gone on. And when you finally realize what's gone on, usually it is too late. Now, folks, that is what we're up against. When you usually find out what's going on, it's too late. Well, as we continue on here, we see that the cultural mandate that's given in Genesis 1 to fill the earth and to create civilization, that that has been directly affected. Verse 16, we see that pain is greatly increased in childbirth. And this is the upside down. We also see that now there's uh, tension that is created in the home. There is a striving for rule between husband and wife. Then we go to verses 17 through 19, and we see that there's this previously flourishing, wondrous, just abounding creation. But now it's cursed. The land. The land is cursed. And again, this is the upside down. It will take hard work, and it will be a challenge just to survive. That's a picture. Did any of you feel like that you just worked so hard, and somehow you're just barely surviving? That's the upside down that we are living in. And it says that mankind is going to physically die and return to the earth. That's the upside down. Verses 23 to 24, if we go down there to the end of chapter 3, we see the, that the Lord drives the former king and queen out of the garden. He places cherubim there with a swirling, flashing sword to guard the garden, to keep them from the garden of delight, to keep them from the tree of life. Now they are outside of the place of the union between heaven and earth. Now they are outside of that place of delight. Now they are outside of that place of the presence of the Lord, the very presence of the Lord. They're outside of that in death. And here we see death for what it really is. It is exile. It is being away from. It is being separated from the presence of the Lord. But now driving them out of the garden, the Lord driving them out of the garden is an act of compassion. The Lord covers them in their shame with 
animal skins because now being outside, fig leaves aren't going to last very long <laughs> outside of the garden. And then the Lord sent them out to keep them from forever existing in death. So that they somehow might, some way, some day, be restored in a new and united heaven and earth in creation as it should be. And if we go back to verses 14 and 15, we also see that there is a hostility between this evil, aggressive enemy and humanity. In other words, it is war. This is war. And this evil being is set on harming and destroying the generations of mankind. And here, too, is compassion because the promise is given that there will be a serpent crusher born to humanity who will put an end to the serpent and his control and his power. Take the serpent down. But in the meantime, it's war. It is war. And this cunning, calculated, and discerning enemy is set on destroying humanity. That's what we're up against, folks. How do you like that? Well, just hang on, because it gets worse. <laughs> now, typically in our theology, we, we stop at the end of chapter 3, and then we jump somewhere else into the New Testament. And we act like Genesis 4 through 11 uh, didn't happen. We act like the rest of the Old Testament just didn't happen. But everything that is in the Bible is there for a reason. Now, we're not going to take a lot of time with this, and one day we will, but Genesis 4 through 11 is here for a reason, and so we're not going to ignore it either. Now, chapter 4 begins uh, with murder in the first family, and it just gets worse from there. And what we want to do this morning is just to call a few insights, and so there's a place in your notes where we can do that. The first insight is this. There are destructive interactions in all of culture and society that take place between rebel spiritual beings and human beings. That's Genesis 4 through 11. is isn't obvious. It's not obvious when we read it in our English Bibles. But to the ancient Near East reader, uh, this is very obvious. It's very clear. Now, a second is that humanity is really messed up in their attitudes and in their actions. So much so that the Lord brings a flood and uh, starts over. And then later on, he actually confuses the people and disturb, disperses the nations into the hands of spiritual beings that they are seeking. Because they're, they're seeking other spiritual beings and they have this in-your-face defiance to the Lord. And so the Lord gives them their choice. And that happens later at the Tower of Babel. And then that leads to this, third, humanity was dispersed into people groups in distinct lands under the rule of rebel spiritual beings in exile from the Lord's presence. Dr. Michael Heiser has called this cosmic geography. And we, uh, in the biblical story is such that we get to the end of Genesis 11 and we see that the Lord is away from the earth. Previously, he's there in the garden. Now we see that he's away from the earth, up in heaven. And that they're actually spiritual oppressors, dominating the nations, exercising influence, ruling over humanity in oppression. And this is the exile of the nations. It's a self-chosen exile. God gave them their choice, but that's what's going on. And this is more of the upside down. And this is where human beings are no longer the real rulers of the world. Humanity exists under the leadership and the oppression of spiritual beings who dominate humanity in darkness and deception. We need to get that. Darkness and deception. And this leads to the fourth insight. And this takes into the account this arc of Genesis 1 through 11. Here it is. Humanity is carrying out the cultural and historical mandate under the deception and oppression of evil spiritual beings in rebellion, in rebellion against the Lord. That's the state of our world, folks. Even now. Babel was the embodiment of rebellion 
against the Lord. And that's the world that we're living in. We're living in that world in, in macro levels, in, in homes and families and relationships, communities and neighborhoods. We're living in that world in a macro level. They were carrying out cultural historical mandate. That's what they were doing. And that's just what humans do by the way that we were originally created to be imagers of God and uh, God's living, breathing idols on this, on this earth. And people still create uh, culture and people still write history today. That's just what it means to be human. That's what we do. But they do that in independence of, in rebellion against, in exile from the presence of the Lord, in rebellion against the Lord, under the leadership and oppression of spiritual beings uh, in darkness who dominate this world. And so you have chaos and incredible violence and all kinds of dehumanizing things that take place and abuse and gross sexual distortions that took place then and also do now. That is what we're up against, folks. I recently had the privilege of spending an evening with a lady who spent a number of years in Chad, not, not, not too long ago. Chad is a land oppressed in darkness. In that country, men have multiple wives and mistresses. And it is acceptable to beat your wives and to beat your, chil uh, your children. And children are little more than trash. The land is filled with uh, witchcraft and what we could call folk Islam. And she uh, witnessed, was aware of, of riots that went on around her. She watched people die in front of her from preventable things, but are just part of this twisted culture. Jenny asked her, is there anything that's illegal? And after a little thought, she said, yes, it's illegal to be a Christian. And it's acceptable for family members to kill a family member that turns and gives their allegiance to Messiah Jesus. But the truth is, is that the United States is also a land under oppression, oppressed in darkness. It's just more hidden here. And it's that we choose to ignore it if it doesn't affect us directly. There's more law and order here, but there's still that underside, there's still that dark side, people oppressed in darkness. There's still murder and death, the killing of the unborn, uh, the lives that are lost just from the, the, the greed and the corruption at micro and macro levels, the managing of the affairs of this world in the worship of deities and demons of mammon, greed, wealth, and drug addiction and human trafficking and the metal, medical and economic and governmental decisions, even, even with COVID-19, there's a lot we don't see. There's a lot we ignore. Humanity is carrying out the culture and historical mandate in rebellion against the Lord. This is taking place under the deceitful, calculated scheming of evil forces which are arrayed against us. And when we get to the New, New Testament, it's talked about this way. It's called the, uh, the, the reign of death, or the reign of sin, or the rule of darkness, or the kingdoms of darkness. And it boil, boils down to the fact that there is calculated scheming and strategy and acts of aggression that come against the human heart. See, the, the battle is not only with world organizations and leaders. It's the hearts of every single human being. There is an agenda to steal, kill, and destroy every human heart. The human heart is the fundamental battleground. Jeff and Sid Holsklaw write, All of those wounded and hurting places that exist inside of us are the battleground. The reign of death plants vicious lies in those places. Lies about who God is and who we are and what life is about. And the strategy is the same as it was in the attack against Adam and Eve. 
the twisting of the truth, the distorting of reality, creating shame, casting doubts, flinging uh, fiery arrows of false accusations and outright lies against ourselves, against our purpose, against God. And the human heart is the place, it is the territory of the most significant battles ever waged. So it's no surprise then that when the wise man writes, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. In fact, if you turn over your notes, I have it there in your notes, I would encourage you to circle that. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Now, when we think about being parents, this is what we need to do. We need to be vigilant about guarding the hearts of our children because there is a cunning, calculated, evil being who is acting in aggression against their heart. And part of the way that we guard the hearts of others is that we guard our own hearts and then teaching them how to guard their own hearts. When we don't guard our hearts, we allow temptation and deception to overtake us. And when we do that, we give a, the devil a foothold in our future generations, even in our uh, uh, communities. There is not only peril to us, there is peril to our future generation, peril to our communities and even the places where we work. So how do we guard our hearts? Well, there's a lot that we could talk about here, and part of that is for you to figure out on your own, but there are a couple of things that we want to mention right now. One way to guard our hearts is, number one, is to think critically, don't be fooled, beware, and unmask the dangers. Now, this is difficult to do because we're all like this. We're all fish in a pond. I mean, we live in this world that is literally creating culture and writing history in rebellion against God, where battles are taking place all the time. And maybe even there are seemingly insignificant little skirmishes that are taking place, but they are strategically designed to entrap you and to kill your heart. And this is the pond that we are swimming in. It is the pond of deception and domination and oppression by spiritual beings. That's the pond that we know. I mean, that's the Kool-Aid that we're drinking. That's the polluted air that we're breathing. And it's normal because we're swimming in it. It's, it's all around us. And we need to engage our cultures in wisdom and being shrewd ourselves. And this means that we don't bury our heads in the sands and just say, oh, I don't want to know but that we actually think critically and engage the world that we're living in. And one of the most obvious dangers is what we call uh, technology, smartphones, our devices. Now, back in the day, our device was uh, the cane that you had that helped you along, or the walker that you had, or the bridge that they put in your, in your mouth to hold the fake tooth in place. Well, today, our devices are those things that bring the world to our fingertips. And it's not all good. Our devices haven't brought more happiness and purpose in our lives. In fact, we can make an argument for the exact opposite. It's pretty obvious when we look around that we are less joyful, that we are less capable in terms of wisdom and character and courage, that we are more overwhelmed and more confused and have less purpose. And our Devices haven't made us better parents in the things that matter. They've made our job exponentially harder as parents to guard the hearts of our children. And even our own hearts. I mean, at best, people say things like this. They say that they waste a lot more time and are more distracted from the things that really matter in life. You know, maybe we need to take a, uh, a fast from our devices on a daily or weekly basis. Put the phone down, walk away for a while, check it periodically. Uh, Rachel Macy Stafford wrote an article just real recently where she addresses this, and she calls it her No Trade Declaration. And here is some of what she has written after her father-in-law uh, passed away, and, 
dearly loved, and, and she's reflecting on that. She writes, It took me only a few days to figure out, and it came down to the trades I was not willing to make in my life. This was my declaration. I was not trading a conversation with my daughter for a mindless scroll on Instagram. And I'm not trading real human connection for shallow online friendships. And I'm not trading likes for love. And I'm not trading tranquility for 24-7 availability. Now, if you haven't figured this out about me, I'll let you know. I do not have my phone glued to my hip. And I'm sorry, I just don't. And I don't have an earbud in my ear so that I can answer uh, calls and be at the world's beck and call and look at every ad that comes in 24-7. If I did with my personality, I would be in the nut house. I'm just telling you. Now, she continues. I'm not training sound mental health for an empty inbox. Now, if there's anything that we don't have today, it's sound mental emotional, and spiritual health. So how about kids not having phones just because their kids do, even when they don't need them? And kids not taking their phones to bed, that, that's not helping them. In fact, that's putting them in danger, not only just with loss of sleep that goes on, but with the stresses and strains and distortions and lies and straight out evil and shame that they are deluged with. How do you help your future generations think critically and unmask the dangers? Well, you have to be practicing that yourself. And then you have to be willing to talk about it in a personal way. It goes with being vulnerable and taking risk and being authentic. See, kids can smell a hypocrite huh, a mile away. And we struggle too. And we need to be real and we need to be honest and, and we need to talk about our, our struggles with them. And we need to meet them at their points of doubt and shame. We need to engage them in their worlds. So it's not us lecturing them and forcing our values, but it's re us reaching out to value them and focus on them and care about them with a genuine concern of where they are at. And there's a lot of pain and danger in growing up in this world. There's a new Netflix show uh, it's uh, Never Have I Ever, and it features an Indian American high school sophomore who's obsessed with doing things that she has never done, like having sex and drinking and stuff like that. Now, this is a reportedly uh, shallow and raunchy uh, show. I'm not recommending it. I haven't watched it, but it is an apt illustration because the lead actress, her name is uh, Devi, her underlying motivation for pursuing the experiences that she, uh, that she is pursuing are in order to numb the pain that she has in her life from her father's sudden death with a heart attack. And then she lives in Southern California with a super strict mom and an unfairly beautiful cousin. Now, this kind of scenario isn't all that uncommon. There's a deeper issue of, of hurt that has spun this young girl into this search for this new identity in things that can never really satisfy and never ever will make her whole. And it's those kinds of things, that wound, those shame, the lies, uh, those, the, those yearnings of the soul that the spiritual deceivers use, that the oppressors use in their calculated strategies to steal and kill the human heart. And you know, our own kids can be overcome with anxiousness and depression, and they can be confused, and there can be things that they face in life that they aren't prepared for. They can have family members that pass away. They can have uh, friends that, that turn on them. They can have classmates that bully them. Uh, they can have uh, superficial things like becoming TikTok famous and then having uh, different guys and girls that are suddenly interested or aware of them. And, and, and that can be deceiving to fill the void that can happen in life of loneliness and pain and, and uh, emptiness, disappointing things in life. Now our job as parents 
no matter how old our children are, as, even as, as, as adults, is to go to our children and enter into their worlds and to engage them where they're at with the things that they are dealing with and to help our kids see the value that we set on them and to develop a relationship of trust and honesty with them and to help them get a sense of God's uh, love and care for them and to have and build a lifelong conversation with them where we can help them think critically about what is coming at them. And that starts when they are little. It's a lot harder to backtrack when they're older. And I would say if you're dealing with that kind of situation where they're older, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be tough. There are going to be challenges. Don't give up. Love, invest, be involved, care, be patient, be prayerful, and let God work. Now, a second way of guarding our hearts is to live in the Word of God. How are you going to think critically? <laughs> now, this is important again because here we are. Fish in a pond. Humanity is carrying out the cultural and historical mandate in rebellion against the Lord under the direction of an enemy who is calculating and crafty and cunning with deception and with acts of aggression against us. And the scripture says that God's word is a, a, a light to our eyes and a lamp to our feet. You know what that's saying? It's the removal of deception. It's the removal of darkness. It's actually being able to see things as they really are. But we even have Christian culture, kind of, again, fish in a pond, that say things like, hey, don't make me work at reading the Bible. Don't make me have to think or have to struggle with that or have to work at understanding it or have to work at applying it to my life. We just come to the Bible and say, hey, just give me a little nugget that'll get me through the day. Give me a little nugget that'll make me feel good. But that is not what the Bible is for. The Bible is Jewish meditation literature. Do you know what that means? That means that we need to read it and reread it and reread it and study the scriptures and meditate and think and ponder and talk them over and wonder uh, and, and reflect over them. And we do that for a lifetime in community with the Word of God. Now, if you don't, you're putting yourself at risk to be a happy meal for the roaring lion seeking to devour us that Peter talks about. This is an actual picture there, folks. We're going to be launched for spiritual oppressors who all the while are deceiving us into thinking, hey, life is fine. This is normal. This is just the way it is. Listen, the Bible is alive. It is powerful. It is active. It is sharp. Look at what the author of Hebrews says. He says, God's word is alive and working, and it is sharper than a double-edged sword. It cuts all the way into us where the soul and spirit are joined to the center of our joints, and it judges the thoughts and feelings in our hearts. You may want to underline that. Guard your hearts, folks. This is how. But you have to spend time focused and prayerful in God's word. And there's a relationship going on with God in the Word of God. I mean, how would you feel if you wanted to talk to someone who was special and important to you and you had something important to share with them and say, hey, I don't have time. Oh, I've got to scroll through Instagram. Oh, just give me a little nugget. I've got to get on my, my light. I've got other important things to do. Well, that isn't what the Bible is. And that is not how the Bible is speaks. The Bible is Jewish meditation literature, and God expects us to read and to study and to talk it over in conversations with Him. Now, we're going to stop here, but I have a question. What part of this message are you going to take hold of and respond to this morning? It's important that we respond to what this message is telling us. After the service, will you talk about this in your time of worship in your home? I would ask you to please, please do. 
This can be a special opportunity. It can be a blessing. This is very, very important for you to be able to guard your hearts. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for revealing to us the story of our world and the story we find ourselves living in. And we ask that you would continue to open our eyes to the upside down that is over our world and involved in and behind the evil that we experience. The evil ones who have the agenda of stealing and killing and destroying our hearts to entrap us and wound us and scare us and harm us and to cause us to do so to ourselves and all the while deceiving us. Lord, help us to be wise to the trysting of, 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 of reality, which is, which is our culture, and to the outright lies, which are so prevalent and so easily believed, and to the weapon of shame, which they use to assault us. Help us to be alert and beware and to step back and to analyze our culture, to examine our own hearts, to think critically, and to seek you to open our eyes to see clearly and to unmask the dangers and the lies and the trickery behind them all. Lord, help us to be people of your word, the Bible, to live and to live into your word, which tells us about the upside down, which tells us what is really going on and the evil that we are up against. Lord, help us to embrace your word as Jewish meditation literature that we are to read and study and think over and ponder and wonder about in reflection and conversations with you, with one another, with the community of followers, to unmask the deceptions, even in people who take your name, who also take your word lightly or ignore it or dismiss it as insignificant, not worth our time. To We fill our days with other things. Lord, your word is truth. Your word leads us to life and healing and wholeness and being rescued from evil and set free in you. And Lord, your word is also a place to meet you. So Lord, we ask that we would have many great conversations with you as we meditate on your word and do that throughout our lives and teach our children to do the same. To live into reality, which is the story of the Bible. And help us to ground ourselves and to guard our hearts by knowing every part of your story and living into it in our allegiance to you. Lord Jesus, be our deliverer, our king, and teach us to guard our hearts. Amen. I have another new song. I know it's a lot, but... I believe that as a church, this song is something that we need right now. That we need to lament what's going on in our lives and in our world right now. The lives being torn apart, the abuse, the hopelessness that leads to suicide, the racial injustice coming to light. We have to say something about it. and. As a church, I think the best thing we can say is that it grieves our hearts as well and that we do serve a God who is unchanging and who is still loving. But there is an enemy that prowls about seeking whom he might destroy. He is the father of lies. But the hope that we do have, the hope that we do have is the Holy Spirit that abides with us, who abides with us, in us, who changes us, who gives us words to speak to others, and who truly cares and comforts. So this song has given word to the cry of my heart right now, and I, I pray that it can give you a voice as well as we cry out to God.
thank you that your spirit abides with us and that in you we can bear fruit in you in you we can have full lives thank you that you care that you grieve with us that you comfort us and protect us so we lift these praises to you, no matter what. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.